300 years ago, the community of Salem, Massachusetts experienced a series of events that rocked the community to its core and questioned the role of women within Puritan society in New England. The tragic events that unfolded reflected that women in Puritan New England were looked at differently than men. The history of witchcraft in America is mainly one of women since the vast majority of known people executed in Salem were women. This project will examine the role of women during the Salem witch trials and seek to find out led to the tragic executions and how did society triumph over such horrible events. New England witchcraft, like so many aspects of colonial life, were transported from the old world to the new. The colonists shared with their old world ancestors assumptions about what kinds of people witches were and what type of actions they engaged in and how to detect them. Belief in witches in England was so widespread that disbelief of it was seen as suspect. The strongest link between England and New England in regards to witchcraft was a special association of women and womanhood as the primary employers of witchcraft. New England colonists reasoned that men and children were only accused because witches did not receive their powers by inheriting them, but rather by passing them to those closest to them. Husbands and daughters were the most likely suspects related to a known witch, especially after those daughters became mature women themselves. In order for a woman to be accused as a witch, one of the necessary requirements was that significant consensus had to be established among the community as a whole. This meant that the woman had to be viewed by many as someone who might get involved in witchcraft. This could be a woman viewed by church leadership as someone commonly known to be living in sin or, like in this case of Anne Hibbins, had a past that was less than good. Hibbins was accused and executed as being a witch. Her accusers used her well-known past of being kicked out of the Boston church years prior for her challenge to religious authority there. This type of behavior was a sin that someone might be aligned with the devil in the late 1600s. What were witches accused of anyway? Witches were believed to create malice within society. That could take the form of witching domestic animals by causing them to get sick or die, cause crop damage, they might even obstruct the reproductive process by preventing conception, causing miscarriages, or even causing deformed births. The most feared action of a witch was the curse. A witch might whisper threats toward a targeted person and initiate harm, but it was not necessary, according to church leaders, to see the curse executed because it was obvious from the behavior of the intended victim that harm had been done. The primary benefit or motive of becoming a witch was the worldly desires that a pact with Satan offered. All the witches had to do was promise allegiance and support to Satan. The afflicted woman might then try to recruit other women, usually younger, by enticing them with material possessions, security, husbands, or simply relief from their daily chores. All of these potential gifts were against popular Puritan doctrine of the late 17th century. Women in Puritan society and distinct roles to fulfill any threat to that social order might be a sign of that witchcraft is present. Equality of the sexes threatened the very foundations of New England's social hierarchy, and it was in this context that many accusations were made. During the first major outbreak of witchcraft in New England, in Hartford, Connecticut, 61 of the 69 accused were women. Massachusetts Bay executed its first witch in 1648, Margaret Jones, an outspoken midwife and lay healer that often threatened the authority of the church openly. Another midwife, Mary Parsons, was accused of witchcraft after the second stillborn child she delivered at the local minister. The minister, perhaps in grief, accused witchcraft at play in the death of his two children. When witchcraft reached Salem in the late 17th century, community dissension was high. Settlers who had lived in the Salem area for generations now had to compete with a new influx of immigrants or refugees that fled an influx of Indian attacks. Land became scarce around Salem. Tensions were also increased when the colony's charter was revoked on several occasions, mostly due to turmoil in England. Possession was a signal that witchcraft had arrived in Salem. The scale at which it occurred was on a scale New England had never seen before. It was also unprecedented in the way that church leaders and regular citizens universally worked together to set out to destroy the witches that lived around them. When three girls began to show signs of possession in 1691, it spread like a disease to other females in Salem. Parents and church leaders put enough pressure on the girls to name the witches or witch who had afflicted them, and they named three witches, Sarah Good, Sarah Osborne, and Carib Indian woman named, known as Tutuba, a slave. The three were sent off to Boston to await trial. 
Good and Osborne maintained their innocence while Tituba, out of fear from her master, confessed to the crime and added details to when and where the acts happened and possessed the girls. She went further and alluded that there were others. Virtually all confessing witches during this period were female. They ranged from under 10 to over 70. Almost all of those possessed were also women, but only those accused in the very beginning were a mixture of poor and prosperous backgrounds. After the Salem executions began in June 1692, Salem authorities dealt with the growing problem of credibility by ignoring accusations against the will to do or by allowing, if not encouraging them to escape. Virtually all confessing witches during this period were female. They ranged from under 10 to over 70. Almost all of those possessed were also women, but only those accused in the very beginning were a mixture of poor and prosperous backgrounds. After the Salem executions began in June 1692, Salem authorities dealt with the growing problem of credibility by ignoring accusations against the will to do or by allowing, if not encouraging them to escape. Close to 200 people were accused of witchcraft during the Salem outbreak. 80% were women, and all but one of the men accused were directly kin to an accused woman. Governor William Phipps suspended the trials in October of 1692. By that time, many ministers and magistrates admitted that the devil had taken the form of many innocents, including that of the governor's own wife, Mary Phipps. Increase Matherin wrote his famous sermon, Cases of Conscience, that the trials were the result of gang of layers and that even had they been possessed or were witches taken over by Satan, God taught them not to receive, certainly not to believe the devil's testimony. This meant that even by their own Puritan doctrine, the accusations from those who were witches or possessed should have had no weight in court. Women were often accused because male ministers and magistrates felt they would be more likely to get a female to succumb to their accusations under interview. Women who were eventually incriminated themselves were much more likely to be executed than a man who did the same thing. John Badstreet confessed that he was a witch. He was whipped and fined for telling a lie. In some cases, women were selected based on their status as a land-owning widow. Eunice Cole was convicted of witchcraft, but was later freed upon the request of her husband for assistance in working at the family farm. When her husband passed away a year later, she was re-arrested for witchcraft, and her land was split up among the town magistrates to redistribute, which they did to their own family members. Women in Salem were certainly targeted because of the greater social hierarchy in New England. However, some good did come from such tragic events. A new idea emerged because of the accusations and testimony of questionable witnesses, many of whom were supposedly possessed or had been possessed by the devil themselves. Courtrooms looked at the accused differently. Instead of assuming guilt upon examination of the defendant, magistrates and courts were now more likely to examine the defendant as innocent until proven guilty, an idea that persisted into the long-term future of the country. The women who became possessed or eventually were convicted based on their mission were in their own way rebelling against the system they knew had already be preconceived notions of them as women's society. On the one hand, they were the product of male-centered religious society that offered them a specific role to play, while on the other hand they recognized that there were only two kinds of women in Salem in the 1680s and 90s, godly women who accepted their place in society and witches. By their own omission as witches, they denied their better satisfaction of accepting their role as submissive women in Puritan society.